In Tolkien's youth, uh, I think the only stable thing uh, uh, through the trials of, of his early years uh, was King Edward School, Birmingham. During his school days, as many students do, Tolkien developed very, very close friendships uh, with three friends in particular, Christopher Wiseman, G.B. Smith and Rob Gilson. And the four of them met up at Wiseman's in December 1914 for an event they called the Council of London. And Tolkien experienced a, a revelation of sorts. He realized that he wanted to become a poet. He realized that he wanted to be a creative writer. This really was the impetus behind the creation of Middle Earth. And the, the Council of London coincided with Tolkien inventing his first Elvish language. He'd, up to this point, been studying Latin, Greek, Old English, all these Indo-European languages. Um, however, I think something which uh, struck him like a, like a boat from the blue was picking up uh, Charles Eliot's Finnish grammar while he was an undergraduate, because this is a language which really is not at all like anything he'd come across before. Arvele ajattelevi, pitkin päätäsi pitävi, kenpä maita kylvämään, toukoja tiittämään. And it inspired him to devise Quenya, the first Elvish language. But Tolkien is also very intrigued by Welsh, a language which he liked very much, uh, and he produced another uh, Elvish language, which is Sindarin, which in some ways is, is rather like Welsh in its uh, phonetic structure. Mae'r byd wedi newid, teimlaf efan y dŵr, teimlaf efan y ddeir, fedrai ei arogli yn yr awyr. So, by 1920, he's already got two fairly well-developed languages, and he wrote this sort of fantasy history to explain, you know, who's speaking these languages, why they're different from each other, um, how they've developed to the forms that he's given them. Uh, and uh, that is uh, the, uh, the beginning, the, the seed uh, of the story which was uh, to become the Silmarillion in the end. Uh, and this contains uh, a history of the elves. It was basically a, a fall from grace, a story of fall from grace, that is, uh, the, the elves were put in the world to, uh, to help fulfill its uh, destiny. But failed, ultimately, because they were too hungry for knowledge. So in the background of Tolkien's thinking was the Christian and Jewish story of Adam and Eve and their rebellion against God. This is reflected in the tales of Middle-earth, both in the elves and in the human races, particularly the stories of the destruction of Numenor, the island that was rather like Atlantis. It, uh, it was destroyed as a consequence of, of human disobedience. Numenor was a remarkable place. Numenor was a gift from the gods to the men of Middle-earth who had fought willingly alongside the elves against the forces of evil, but Numenor became corrupted. Uh, their kings became arrogant. Their kings tried to take eternal life from the Valar. The Valar didn't like that. And in the end, the Numenoreans, they set up an armada to invade the Undying Lands and take immortality by force. And Numenor is ultimately drowned by the wrath of God. Only the faithful, those who had remained true, were rescued and saved. Isildur, who is mentioned several times, and his father Elendil, were among those survivors. Um, and they came and they set up the kingdoms of Gondor in the south and Arnor in the north. And it was from those people that Aragorn was descended, people who had already demonstrated that they had within them the power to be corrupted, to be flawed. Aragorn has a lot of moments, you know, there's a nagging doubt he has about his worthiness. He labors from the beginning with the fear he has that he's not going to be up to the task. Why do you fear the past? You are a sealed door there, not a sealed door himself. You are not bound to his fate. The same blood flows in my veins. Aragorn had all the qualities of this ancient civilization and he was very aware of the, the problems of power and, and of misusing power and of, of being disobedient. So here is Aragorn representing a race of people whose origin is gone, has been wiped from the face of the earth, is no more like Atlantis. It was sucked down into the depths of the ocean. 
Now, the concept of being overwhelmed by the sea is placed in the book because of something that was very personal for Tolkien. From childhood, Tolkien recalled having a terrible nightmare, a recurrent dream of a great wave coming in over green fields, engulfing the land. Uh, now, in uh, The Lord of the Rings, he actually uh, gives this to Faramir, and Faramir is said to have this uh, recurrent dream. Uh, in the movie, this is actually shifted and given to Eowyn. I dreamed I saw a great wave climbing over green lands and above the hills. I stood upon the brink. It was utterly dark in the abyss before my feet. And the reason we gave it to Eowyn is simply because we wanted to use it. We couldn't find how to use it with Faramir. It's one of the examples of, of something that would have just stayed in the book and would never have seen the light of day and was an incredibly important piece of personal information, I believe, from Professor Tolkien. All writers pour into their work elements of themselves. So, for example, when you look at the way in which he creates the people of Rohan, you feel instinctively this is a man who understood horses. Before the war, Tolkien had joined something called King Edward's Horse. It was a battalion, and this was his first um, and his major experience of, of being around horses, and, and, and he um, seems to have shone. Because the job that he got was breaking in the horses, and he, he was actually rather aggrieved about it because no sooner had he broken in a horse and got it to, to do what it was supposed to do, than that horse was taken away and given to some other officer, and he was given another rookie horse to break in. This experience obviously shows that there's there's more than mere abstractions behind the whole idea of Rohan. I can imagine the um, the Rohirrim is representing a form of wish fulfillment for Tolkien because as he describes them they're very similar to Anglo-Saxons but with this addition of horses. And Tolkien actually had a wild theory and the theory was that if the English had had a cavalry we would probably never have lost the Battle of Hastings because when these great horse masters came across the sea from France they just trampled all over us. And I think he felt that with the Norman invasion, which was a, a great catastrophe, that that influx of Norman culture prevented a full flowering of English mythology. So um, the riders are an image of the Anglo-Saxons not as they were, but as they might have been. And perhaps if they'd retained a little bit more of, as it were, rider culture, uh, then uh, they might not have lost at Hastings and uh, present English civilization would not have been as Frenchified uh, as it has been, something which Tolkien thought was, a, you know, a literary disaster. So the creation of the people of Rohan not only shows that Tolkien had an innate understanding of horses, but that he had the greatest respect and reverence for them. And this is something which comes from his experiences in the First World War. You know, we have to remember that the First World War was the last of the great battles where people rode out with horses. It was the, it was the age when horsepower met machine power. For Tolkien, the fact that machinery had entered warfare takes away any of that old romantic heroism. The nobility of warfare no longer exists once you're able to deal death at a distance. Tolkien obviously experienced mechanized warfare at its worst in the First World War, and it, it left a profound impression on him. The story he wrote straight after the Battle of the Somme was called The Fall of Gondolin, and it tells how a great and beautiful city of the elves is attacked by Morgoth. And the force, of course, consists of uh, orcs, yes, but also dragons and also what look like tanks. Which, of course, Tolkien had seen on the Somme. Tanks were a secret weapon that made its debut there in September 1916. And this sense of mechanization as being a force of war is something which carries through to the Lord of the Rings. You see it in the preparations that Saruman makes for war. You see it in the mechanical way in which the forces of Mordor march on the Alliance. As he's writing the Lord of the Rings, you can sometimes see Tolkien, as it were, recycling earlier works. I know he didn't do that with the fall of Gondolin. He didn't sort of 
uh, cut and paste chunks out and make it into the, into the siege of Minas Tirith. But there's obviously a, a similarity. We have Gondolin and Gondor. They, you know, they come from the same root in Elvish. And there's a sense also of the uh, warfare of machine against wall. And you could say there's yet another connection, which is both of them, Gondor and Gondolin, are attempts to make things static. The elves uh, have this urge to hang on to things and lock them into stasis. And you could say that the same thing, in a way, is true of Denethor. Gandalf asks him, what do you want? And he says, uh, I would have things the way they were, as in the times of my long fathers. And just like, as it were, the prehistoric elves, he won't accept any compromises. He'd rather die. In fact, he does rather die. There is no victory. I think one of the things that Tolkien realized quite early on, as he wrote The Lord of the Rings, was that it was going to be impossible to put into the book everything that was crowding into his mind. All the links and connections back to other stories and all the things that he knew underpinned this great structure he was creating, he wanted to tell people. He uh, built things in at the start because he didn't know how it was going to finish. Uh, and then when it got to the end, he, uh, he hadn't got space for them or he couldn't bring them in without spoiling the balance. So he started developing this elaborate idea of creating appendices to the book. The, the whole tale of Aragorn and Arwen is moved into an appendix. It clearly ought to be part of the story, but how are you going to tell it? He did think about how he could work her into the, the body of the text uh, and never found a satisfactory way of doing it. It would have slowed the story down completely and been out of place. But actually, uh, Arwen is a very important figure because she introduces the theme of, of death. The fact that Arwen casts off her immortality for the love of a mortal man is truly the greatest sacrifice in the entire story. And perhaps one of the strange things there is that you can see uh, Tolkien uh, sympathizing very strongly with Arwen. He sees the story from her angle, perhaps even more than from Aragorn's. She wittingly chooses death, but she does that, really, out of love. I choose a mortal life. We do not realize just how significant and important this character is, but her relationship with Aragorn is absolutely central to how Aragorn behaves. The condition that Elrond puts on Aragorn is that he may not have it. Uh, his daughter Arwen's hand in marriage until he defeats Sauron essentially and becomes king and once he's earned that then he's earned the right uh, stories about a, a, a mortal and an immortal pairing uh, you know are there in the in the in the folklore of northern Europe uh, but they're I think especially important to Tolkien one of them is Aragorn and Arwen but there are others back in his mythology uh, there's the union of uh, Beren and Luthien Luthien is a very high-ranking elf princess. Beren is a survivor from a, a human group which has been almost wiped out. And Beren stumbles upon her while she's dancing in a woodland glade, and he's never seen anything so beautiful in his life, and his heart is struck still by the sight of her. And her father, of course, is, has no intention of giving up his daughter to a ragged stranger from the wilderness, and a human at that. This story not only was very important in the early tales of Middle-earth, but it had particular meaning for Tolkien in his life. As, as a young man, he'd fallen in love with Edith Bratt. They fell in love, but uh, Tolkien's guardian said that he couldn't marry till he was 21. And Tolkien, being uh, the stubborn, pig-headed sort he was, waited till one minute after midnight on his 21st birthday and then wrote her a proposal of marriage and posted it. And she accepted it. Their love is something we know very little about, but we do know that he and his young wife took a walk in a wood that was filled with hemlock, and that she danced for him and sang for him. And that that image, that very, very personal image of the woman he loved, became the image that he used to describe the meeting of Beren and Luthien. Tolkien identified so closely with this story that when Edith died, he had the name Luthien written on her tombstone. I think that's a great statement about his love for his wife. He felt that she, in a way, you know, had, uh, had, had, had given him something immensely precious, which he valued above everything else. Some people say that he tended to, st to stick women on pedestals, but I think if you read deeper into it, especially if you go into the story of Luthien and Beren, 
you understand that, that it's about intimacy. And for Tolkien, it, it clearly was the central myth of love at the heart of his work, his love for his wife. I think her death um, you know, shattered him uh, completely. Love and loss are inextricably bound. For Tolkien to have lost Edith really was the end of his world in many ways. And when he eventually himself died, the name Beren is on his stone. Beren and Luthien, Arwen and Aragorn, Ronald and Edith. In a way, they are all one and the same. One very important aspect of the story of Beren and Luthien was the way that the, the lives of human beings and elves became intermingled. And the great significance of these stories for Tolkien was tied in with his Christian belief in the ultimate incarnation, that God humbled himself and became a human being. In Tolkien's work, the elves represent perfection and the ideal qualities of human life. And so, through the intermarriage of elves and human beings, their lives intermingle, resulting in a fuller humanity. And in their coming together, a part of the elves remains with us today and passes in to the bloodline of men so that all is not lost. We do have a glimpse of Eldarion, the son by Aragorn and Arwen, in this bloodline, this perfect mixture of elvenkind and mankind. This one scion of both trees remains and will be a strong leader for the people of Middle-earth, who represents everything that is good in Middle-earth and not just mankind. And from that point on, the divine and the human are intermingled and so we have a much more intimate relationship with our creator through that. And if you look closely and listen closely, the music of Mozart, you know, the painting of Raphael, you can see it, the elves are still with us. Tolkien structures the books in a very strange way where he, he has these big chunks. It's not the intercutting, the tight cross-cutting that there is in the movies, it's just big blocks. The way in which Tolkien writes means that he leapfrogs in his narrative. He tells you about one group of people, then he goes off and tells you about another. But one, one of the effects of the kind of strand-by-strand strand narration of The Lord of the Rings is that the characters on any one strand uh, don't know what's going on on the other strands. And uh, one of the most important cross-connecting devices is the palantir. Seven palantiri, the seeing stones, were brought from Numenor by Elendil to Middle-earth, and he installed them all around his realm as a way of communicating. And the Palantir always tells you the truth, but it encourages you to draw the wrong conclusion from it. And I think they're used uh, four times uh, in, the, uh, in The Lord of the Rings as a book. Uh, the first time is uh, Saruman has been using it, and it seems that Sauron has been showing him his build-up of power. So Saruman is quickly corrupted in his way because what he sees is the opportunity to fulfill his own ambitions. Next time is uh, Pippin looking in it and Sauron draws from this the wrong conclusion. He sees a hobbit in the Orthanc stone. He assumes that Saruman has the hobbit and furthermore that the hobbit has the ring, so Saruman has the ring. Which is the reason that Pippin must be removed to a place of safety, which is Minas Tirith. Next time Sauron looks in it, uh, he actually sees Aragorn. Aragorn takes the seeing stone and he looks into it in order to draw the eye of Sauron. It's a tremendously brave act. And Sauron once again draws the wrong conclusion, which is that Aragorn has the ring. Now this is very important because uh, one thing it does is to make uh, Sauron strike too fast. Uh, and as, as it says in the book, the hasty stroke oft goes astray. The other interesting use of the Palantir is that the seeing stone that is still held at Minas Tirith has been used by Denethor, the Lord Steward. In the White Tower, Denethor also has a Palantir. Do you think the eyes of the White Tower are blind? I have seen more than you know. And if you check the dates, which I have, uh, he's actually seen Frodo in the hands of Sauron because Sauron has already captured Frodo. So Denethor looks in the Palantir, and like everybody else, he draws the wrong conclusion. 
So Sauron thinks Aragorn's got the ring. Uh, Denethor thinks Sauron's uh, got the ring. And in fact, uh, at that moment, Sam's got the ring, which nobody knows at all except Sam. It's a very modern concept in a way. It, it's the concept of misinformation. And it so reflects how modern communication can give people a fraction of something and by so doing influence the way in which they react, the way in which they behave. Uh, so uh, the Palantir actually, just like the Mirror of Galadriel, is uh, very dangerous as a guide to action. All these are bad ways to make decisions. You should actually make decisions based on what you yourself know. Well, the corollary of that, though, I think, is that uh, you mustn't try and second guess. You may not have enough knowledge to be able to have just that one bit of information that would totally transform your supposition about the way things are. And I think, actually, that Tolkien had this in his head as a kind of uh, infantryman slogan. Uh, because the infantryman slogan is, look to your front. If you start looking behind you and worrying about what your mates are doing, and they're looking at you and wondering what you're doing, then nobody is paying attention to what they should be doing. So you have to slog on. The trouble with that, of course, is that you can very easily persuade yourself that things are going badly somewhere else, so there's no chance for you, so that you might as well give up. And once you've given up, of course, this prophecy is self-fulfilling. Despair plays a huge part in the symbolism of Lord of the Rings because it is the flip side of hope. And it's played out most obviously through the characters of Theoden and Denethor. They're both old men who've lost their sons. Uh, Theoden has lost Theodred and uh, Denethor has lost a Boromir. They also both have surviving male heirs, but they don't regard them. Theoden doesn't regard Eomer, his nephew, as having any worth. Denethor doesn't regard Faramir, his son, as having any value. You could draw this out. The parallels are really quite close. But actually, the thing is that they then take different routes. Denethor has succumbed to despair. He has allowed his mind to become prey to the blackness that creeps out from the Dark Tower because he has looked into the Palantir. He persuades himself. He knows what's going to happen. Gondor is lost. There is no hope for men. And so he falls into despair, and he ends up committing suicide, which is, you might say, the, the ultimate form of, of despair. Now, Theoden is, uh, is heading the same way. Theoden eventually manages to use the loss of his son as fuel to impel him into action. And instead of succumbing to despair and just looking at the task that lies before him, this overwhelming army that they face at the Pelennor Fields, he rides to glory. When it comes to it, there are, there are more powerful things for him than despair, and one of them is the urge to live up to his ancestors. That's what he says as he's dying. I go to my father's, in whose mighty company I shall not now feel ashamed. To understand the Lord of the Rings, you have to understand something that was motivating Tolkien very strongly, which is that however dark and bad and terrible things seem, that there is a moment of turning, a moment when dark is turned to light, when dawn dispels night. He called it the eucatastrophe. Well, uh, we have a very familiar term, you know, catastrophe, uh, which is a sudden turn from good to bad. And Tolkien said that actually there ought to be the opposite of this, which is eucatastrophe. And eucatastrophe is the sudden and unpredicted and unpredictable turn from bad to good. Tolkien related eucatastrophe to um, the story of Christ, to the idea that out of the tragedy of the crucifixion could come salvation for all mankind. And Tolkien finds it not only in the resurrection, but also uh, powerfully in fairy tales. Happily ever after is the ending of almost every fairy tale ever conceived. And he also said it's something that you experience in real life, but how rarely you experience it in the modern novel. And in The Lord of the Rings, that is what you experience. At the crack of doom, when all seems to be at the point of potential failure, disaster has been reached, the corner is turned. The happy event ensues. This is where that eucatastrophe, that happy turn of events, is played out. 
That is where good comes out of evil. At the heart of this story, amidst all these heroic deeds and noble warriors, friendship is one of the most powerful themes of the whole tale, and it must in some part hark back to Tolkien's lost friendships. Tolkien's group of friends at school uh, kind of formalised the bond between them in his final year as a school pupil at King Edward's School in Birmingham. And so they called themselves very grandly the Tea Club and Barovian Society. The TCBS wanted to uh, reinvigorate the Middle Ages, to bring them back to, uh, to a world which they felt uh, you know, was, was missing something. It's what every young person feels, that they stand at a point in life when they can change the world. But this same group of people were very soon to be sucked into the First World War. Tolkien served in the Great War alongside several of his closest friends. And he hoped that he would be able to join his friend G.B. Smith's battalion. As things turned out, he managed to join the same regiment, but a different unit. Smith, who of course was the fellow poet in the TCPS, um, hugely appreciated what Tolkien was doing in, in writing the first poetry of what became Middle Earth. Tolkien sent him poems that Smith read in the trenches. One night, Smith was about to head out on a patrol, and he wrote to Tolkien. My chief consolation is that if I am scuppered tonight, there will still be left a member of the great TCBS to voice what I dreamed and what we all agreed upon. May God bless you, my dear John Ronald, and may you say the things I have tried to say long after I am not there to say them, if such be my lot. Clearly, Smith's encouragement, sealed by his death on the Somme in December 1916, must have been both a, uh, an inspiration and, and something of a burden for Tolkien. And in the subsequent conflicts, Tolkien lost all but one of those close friends. It was a loss that remained with him for his whole life. Tolkien seems to have felt that he had inherited uh, from the others their, their uh, ambitions and that it was up to him to, uh, to fulfill them. All hopes were pinned on Tolkien. It was, it was up to Ronald to, to bear the torch, to go forward. Uh, but Tolkien had a recurrent fear, and the fear was that nobody was ever going to read his work. And it was actually a very well justified fear. He was 62 uh, when The Lord of the Rings did get published. And uh, just about the time that the, uh, the book came out in 1954, uh, Tolkien uh, uh, wrote a, a letter in which he said that uh, once upon a time, of course, it's all you know, he's given up on now, he, he did hope to create a mythology which uh, other people would take over and could uh, adapt and, and use. He was going to create a, uh, a kind of grand tapestry and he would sketch out the myths and then other people would come in with music and art and, um, and song. But he says, well, you know, I, I, my, my crest has fallen since, you know, I haven't got such, such uh, immense ambitions. Uh, but of course, actually, he could have had such immense ambitions because that's what's happened. Lo and behold, he discovers he's got an audience of people who not only want to devour it, but want more, please, give us more. <laughs> One of the, th the surprising things about The Lord of the Rings is that although it's an English setting, it has an appeal throughout the world. And I think it must be because Tolkien is touching upon something that's central to who we are as human beings. There is a hopefulness to the story and to life, you know, and that's what the Tolkien's on about too, you know, looking ahead and saying, well, I hand this to you now. I hand this story to you that was handed to me and let's see what you can do with it. I think Lewis said once that uh, a myth was a story that everybody knew about, even if they couldn't remember ever reading or hearing any version of it. And I think that's rather like that with Lord of the Rings. Uh, everybody knows about it, even if they haven't read it. It's become part of the, the mental furniture of the culture. And I think that is exactly what happens with true works of art, real works of art. Uh, it enables those works to survive changes of opinion, uh, changes of culture, of history, uh, because uh, each new generation of readers finds new meanings in it. <laughs>